Good afternoon. The industrialist and Colombian Leo Silver established the Gabriel Silver Lecture in honor of his father shortly after the conclusion of the Second World War. His goal was to promote the cause of peace, and he believed that bringing world leaders to our campus for discussions about international affairs would advance this project. In 1950, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, then president of Columbia University, delivered the inaugural Gabriel Silver Lecture. General Eisenhower spoke about a subject that he was uniquely qualified to explain, namely the obstacles to building and preserving a peaceful global society in the wake of World War II. He called for many things in his speech, but chief among them was the rejection of what he called, quote, the policies and prejudices which balk the free exchange, block the free exchange of ideas between nations, of information and knowledge that will make human living a more full expression of man's dignity. Eisenhower properly understood that respect for knowledge and the sharing of information is essential for democracy and a necessary foundation of a tolerant society. According to Columbia's president at the time, constraining such expression would have the effect of undermining global peace and prosperity and spawning ignorance and distrust. Nearly 70 years later, his words resonate loudly. So much of what we are focused on here at Columbia, so much we're focused on, but a project that I know consumes the interest of the World Bank is supporting our research and scholarship, the new wave of collective global action sufficient to meet the many different problems facing humanity. This requires a substantial proliferation of partnerships between universities and governments and NGOs and the world institutions such as the World Bank. Columbia School of International and Public Affairs has a proud history of engaging in precisely this type of partnership and endeavor. And the work they have pioneered at Columbia will now become much more common across the breadth of the university as the result of a new effort we have launched this last spring and this fall called Columbia World Projects. A feature of this initiative will be to devise productive and practical collaborations capable of producing measurable change with partners beyond academia, partners such as the World Bank. In a moment, the Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, Mara Jano, will formally introduce our guest, Dr. Jim Kim. For now, I simply want to say that Dr. Kim is a fitting person to continue the tradition begun by Dwight Eisenhower at the middle of the 20th century and carried forward by an august group of former Gabriel Silver lecturers, including George Marshall, Madeleine Albright, Stephen Breyer, and Bon Ki-moon. I know Dr. Kim to possess the expansive skills needed to succeed at the upper echelons of higher education and also as the role of a global policymaker. He has demonstrated these capacities as a formidable advocate for addressing global health concerns and now as head of the World Bank where he has made the ending of extreme poverty the organization's overarching goal. We are really honored, Jim, to have you with us today. Before I conclude, I want to thank Michelle Fleury for moderating the question and answer period following Dr. Kim's talk. I also want to recognize Dean Mara Jano for all she has accomplished as Dean of the School of International Public Affairs. The school is thriving so many ways under 
Dean Jano's leadership, SEPA has launched new initiatives in cybersecurity, central banking, and financial policy, and social entrepreneurship. And she also contributes significantly to SEPA and the university through her own expertise in international trade and investment policy. Thank you, and please now welcome Dean Merritt Jano. Good morning. Thank you, President Bollinger. Columbia University has never been stronger, and it's really your leadership that's been the driving force for Columbia's global vision and the relevance and success of this great institution. It's a privilege for me to serve as Dean of SEPA. I see friends, colleagues, and students thank you for joining us for the 2017 Gabriel Silver Memorial Lecture, which the School of International and Public Affairs is delighted to host in collaboration with the World Leaders Forum. As noted, the Silver Lecture is SEPA's most prestigious lecture, established in 1950 to foster international understanding on critical global challenges. We've been fortunate to have had extraordinary leaders to deliver the Silver Lecture. President uh, Bollinger alluded to Dwight Eisenhower when he was president of the university. Rajiv Gandhi as Prime Minister of India and most recently Ban Ki-moon during his final months as Secretary General. And today we continue this very important tradition by welcoming to Columbia University Dr. Jim Kim, President of the World Bank Group. In its more than 70 years of operation, the bank and its partner agencies have played an essential role supporting economic advancement and addressing defining problems facing humanity. And while we know the bank was originally founded in the aftermath of the World War II to support rebuilding of countries riven by war, it has continually redefined its mission to evolve and ensure its relevance and its ability to meet the needs of global populations and countries worldwide. In the early part of its history, it focused on infrastructure investment around the world, later on loans and technical assistance, and then prioritized poverty alleviation and more. Its impact has been immense, and the world has made progress. Its recent projections by the World Bank suggest that for the first time in human history, the number of people living in extreme poverty has fallen below 10% of the global population. For our part, SEPA is devoted to much of the same core mission of the bank. More than half of our students today are studying international trade, finance and development, sustainability and the environment, other areas critical to the bank. We have numerous faculty that continue to serve or have served in senior positions at the bank. Our one of our most popular degree programs is a collaboration with the World Bank since 1992. Our students regularly work with the bank's teams on capstone projects, including six just last spring on extension of educational services in Malaysia, assessing digital technology and communications infrastructure in Malawi, promoting open data in Tanzania, with more than 230 SEPA alumni, either currently or formerly part of the World Bank system. Uh, Dr. Kim, I say to you, your visit today is of deep significance to the school and our community, and I'm very grateful that you have chosen our university to deliver this major address in advance of the upcoming bank fund meetings. Dr. Kim brings unique attributes to his leadership of the World Bank, a former university president as a scientist and doctor. Dr. Kim joined the World Bank Group in July 2012, and soon after he assumed his position, he established two ambitious goals to guide his work, to end extreme poverty by 2030 and to boost shared prosperity, focusing on the bottom 40% of the population in developing countries. In September last year, the World Bank Group Board unanimously reappointed him to a second five-year term. 
And already during his first term, the World Bank Group supported the development priorities of countries at levels never seen outside of a financial crisis, and with its partners, achieved successive record replenishment of World Bank Fund for the Poorest. The institution also launched several innovative financial instruments, including facilities to address infrastructure needs, prevent pandemics, help millions of people force, forcefully displaced by climate shocks, conflict, violence, and also to support financial inclusion. Before joining the World Bank Group, Dr. Kim, a physician and anthropologist, served as president of Dartmouth College and held professorships at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Public Health. From 2003 to five, he was director of the World Health Organization's HIV AIDS department, where he led the three by five initiative, the first ever global goal for AIDS treatment to expand access to antiretroviral medication in developing countries. In 1987, he co-founded the Partners in Health, a nonprofit organization that works in poor communities on four continents. He has received numerous awards, and today he delivers the Silver Lecture and an important moment for the bank. Just days before its annual meeting in Washington next week, and indeed at a significant period in the world, a time of rising tension, immense humanitarian crisis, and when globalization itself has come under strain. We look forward to his views today on the many challenges facing the world and how the bank will continue to engage the future in areas critical to human progress and the global economy. Following his presentation, Dr. Kim has graciously agreed to take questions from our audience in a discussion moderated by Michelle Fleury, New York business correspondent for the BBC. Without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kim to deliver his remarks. Yeah, thank you Thanks very much. Uh, Th thank you so much, uh, Dean Janow, and uh, I'm especially glad to be here with my old friend, Lee Bollinger. Uh, you know, in 2009, when I became president of, uh, of Dartmouth College, I went to my first Ivy League president's meeting, and I think it was here in New York, Lee, and I was thinking, oh my God, we get to go, and with these eminent scholars, people like Lee Bollinger, we're going to sit down and talk about the most important problems of the day, we're going to discuss higher education and its role in the world, we talked the whole time about football. Right? And we talked about football because that's, it's a league, it's a sports league, and where you set the academic index lower border determines whether you win or not. And Lee has done so much for this school, but I think he may be remembered for Columbia being 3-0 and in, on their football team <laughs> and leading the Ivy League with Dartmouth uh, right now. But, uh, I just, it's great to be here. Lee's been here for 15 years. You know, being university president is one of the most difficult jobs uh, that I can imagine, having had the experience for a relatively short period of time. But I, I want to pay tribute to Lee and all he's done in so many different fields in the defense of uh, affirmative action, the defense of diversity. You know, he's, he's a great man and I'm honored to be here with him. Thank you. So today, uh, the the crisis, and Dean Jay now, I think, talked about it a little bit. It seems that commitments to human solidarity are breaking down. We have nationalism, we have uh, isolationism, uh, revolting against trade agreements. Uh, there are so many forces in the world that seem to say, you know, we don't really want to embrace the rest of the world. What we're going to focus on is what's in it for us. And so I think that the most important thing that we have to do in the World Bank Group, but also especially in universities and places like Columbia, is to rebuild the foundations of human solidarity. And so after having worked on trying to build human solidarity around the issues of health and education for most of my life, uh, we come to a moment now when, when we have to ask ourselves the question, how do we rebuild these foundations? Now, I also want to let you know that this is an absolutely urgent task. Everywhere I go, I see images just like this, where young people are on 
uh, broadband, they're looking at their smartphones, and more and more, and this is going to be complete very soon, everyone in the world, no matter how poor, knows how everyone else lives. And it's a real phenomenon. It, it's, uh, we call it the reference income, and this is research that we've done at the World Bank Group. The more access you have to the internet, the more your reference income goes up. In other words, the income to which you compare your own goes up. So what we found is that uh, when, when you start seeing how well other people are living, you have higher aspirations, higher ambition, and there are a lot of good effects. But the other thing that we see is if your aspirations start to rise, but then there's no opportunity, uh, it can lead to fragility, conflict, violence. I mean, so much of what happened during the Arab Spring uh, was a result of uh, people getting, having a college education but being unemployed. In Tunisia, the highest rates of unemployment during that time were among college-educated young people, over 50% unemployment. So this is the crash course we're going down. This is the, this is the uh, collision that we, we're seeing. High aspirations, lower opportunities, and, and uh, the need to invest more in people. Now, this talk, uh, in, in so many ways, and I, I beg your um, indulgence on this, it took me my whole life to prepare for it. And so I'm going to get a little bit biographical because it's hard to understand where I'm coming from without telling you a little bit about um, uh, where I uh, came from. So this is me. And it was about in 1962 or 1963. I was born in Korea, uh, uh, not too long after the Korean War. And uh, as you can see, I was pretty well fed back then. I was well taken care of. Uh, and my parents, through really freakish good fortune, had actually met and married in New York City. Right here, my mother was a student at Union Theological Seminary. My father was a dental student studying at NYU. And they met in New York City, married here. My older brother was born here. And then they went back to Korea to try to make their lives. But what happened to them uh, is something that happened to very, very few Koreans. By being here, by being in New York City, their aspirations were raised. And of course, their aspirations for us were raised. And so I had, a, I had the great opportunity then to come back to the United States when I was about five years old and uh, live out the, the, the rest of my life uh, as, an, as an American. Back then, though, uh, the World Bank, which, as Dean Janow described, uh, came out of the ashes of World War II and was founded to uh, rebuild Europe, uh, wasn't very, uh, let's say, uh, uh, didn't have very high aspirations for Korea. And, and what they said, it's probably hard for you, to, let, me, let me read it for you. Korea would find it difficult without foreign aid to provide its people with more than the bare necessities of life. So Korea didn't qualify for a World Bank loan because it was so poor until I was about three years old, 1962. And uh, the relationship between the World Bank Group and Korea, the long history of the, of the relationship between the World Bank Group and Korea has really had a profound impact on me and how I lead the institution in, an, in, in a bunch of different ways. So first of all, uh, uh, the World Bank uh, had said very negative things about Korea's prospects. Just look at the country in 1959, the year I was born. Uh, most of the natural resources, mineral wealth, was in the northern half of the country, north of the 38th parallel. The industrial part of the peninsula was also in the northern part. The southern part of the peninsula was the agricultural part. Uh, literacy levels were below 20% uh, in the early 1960s. Uh, so no industrial base, no natural resources, agricultural, low levels of literacy. Now, uh, back then, right about at that time, uh, some of the explanations for Korea's inability to develop were focused on Confucianism. They said, you know, Korea uh, has a, a fundamentalist form of Confucianism, and because of that, they will never be allowed, they will, they will never be able to grow. And then probably 20 years later, uh, the development economists at the time said, you know, it's Korea's commitment to Confucianism that has allowed them to grow. So it, 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 it uh, helped me to, to, to gain a healthy skepticism about uh, the, pr the, the pronouncements 
of, uh, of uh, uh, especially development economists in thinking about the prospects for different countries. And so now, uh, w one thing I tell everybody is that in the World Bank group of today, there's no such thing as lost causes. There's no country that we're going to get out of because we think there's no hope. Uh, in this case, uh, hope is not the result of analysis, but hope and belief and optimism has to be a moral choice. Every single country should be able to rise out of the ashes just like Korea. The other thing, though, was that uh, the second project that Korea received World Bank funding for was education. And the World Bank uh, was very much against it. Right? They were very much against uh, Korea investing in education in just its second loan. And at the time, uh, there was a very strong sense at the World Bank Group that what you do is you invest in infrastructure. In other words, get rich first, and once you get rich, then you can invest in your people. But the Koreans rejected uh, that idea. You know, it was really pretty, um, uh, pretty stark. There was, a, there was a gentleman named Robert Garner, uh, a, a very respected World Bank development economist who later uh, was the first president of our private sector group, uh, IFC. And in, um, uh, in a trip to Colombia, and Colombia had presented a plan for its development that balanced infrastructure investment with, uh, with human capital investments, with investments in health and education. And his response to that pr proposal, he said, and I quote, damn it, we can't go messing around with education and health. We're a bank. Now, this persisted for a very long time, and I would argue that in many ways, it persists up to today. Now, uh, thinking about all these different issues and, uh, and, and, and in, in the process of moving to the United States, uh, had the great good fortune of having a father who was very practical, uh, he was a dentist, and my mother studied at Union Theological Seminary. She was a philosopher. She eventually did her PhD in philosophy, in, uh, in, in fact, studied Confucianism. Those two influences were very powerful in my life, but uh, I was leaning far more toward my mother's way of approaching the world than my father's. And so one day, I, was, I did my undergraduate work at Brown University, and one day, uh, I flew home after the semester, and my father picked me up at the airport. We were living in Iowa at the time, so he picked me up and we were driving along this rural road back home. And he asked me, he said, this was my sophomore year, he said, so Jim, what are you thinking of majoring in? And I told him, Dad, I'm going to major in politic, political science and philosophy, and I'm going to lead a social movement someday. Right? So my father, the dentist, slowly pulled the car over to the side of the road. <laughs> and he said, he said, look, after you finish your residency, you can study anything you want. <laughs> now, now, you laugh, but when I tell this story uh, to an audience of Asian American uh, older people, they don't laugh at all because it's like, of course, that's the right thing to do. It turns out I'm very grateful to him for having done that. But what I did was I sort of went around um, uh, uh, his admonitions. I went to medical school, and at the same time, I did a PhD, and this is um, uh, the campus of Harvard where I did both uh, my degrees. And at the time, uh, I felt like the task for me was to bring these two together, bring medicine together uh, with the study of anthropology. And anthropology, you know, we studied all the great thinkers, Marx and Engels, and at the time, you know, Pierre Bourdieu was the, was the, was the sort of hot French um, thinker of the time. And we studied all these different views of how to move the world toward one in which there was more human solidarity, more equality, opportunities for everyone. There were many different views, and in fact, when I was in graduate school, there were strongly competing views. There was one view that said uh, that planned economies that trade with each other and, and work for equality of outcomes is the right approach. And there was another approach that was saying all of us have to deal with the market system. And in studying these different approaches to how society should be organized, uh, one of the things that struck me uh, and this was in teaching the an introductory anthropology course as a, as a graduate student. One of the things that struck me is that the, the drive toward human solidarity is deeply embedded uh, in our, in, 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 you know, I don't want to say genes, but it's deeply embedded uh, in the way that we have evolved as human beings. Uh, I remember stories that we were telling about, um, uh, 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 about the uh, bones of, uh, of ancient peoples, I mean, tens of thousands of years uh, prior, where you could tell uh, that there was an older gentleman who would had a handicap uh, his entire life, and so literally would have had to be carried around by his family and the tribe. 
And so this, this sense that human solidarity was at the core of what allowed us to survive uh, uh, all these years as a, as a species uh, was core. Now, at that time, uh, you know, for me, I remember graduate school as just like an idyllic experience where I, I could spend the whole day reading a book and uh, sitting in cafeterias talking to people. But eventually, uh, as I finished, uh, I asked myself the question, so what do I do? What, what, is, what is my responsibility and what can I do to bring these grand ideas together with practical solutions? And so I met these two people, Paul Farmer and Ophelia Dahl, and we started this group called Partners in Health. And by the way, the film is opening tonight. It's playing somewhere uh, in, in, uh, in the theaters in New York City starting tomorrow. Uh, and we founded this organization uh, with the idea uh, that we were going to provide health care to the poorest people in the world, and we were going to do it on the basis of a philosophy. And the philosophy that we adopted uh, uh, came from liberation theologians, uh, and many of those ideas were, were crafted you know, in this neighborhood. Uh, liberation theologians, and we called it a preferential option for the poor. And for us, it was a preferential option for the poor in healthcare. And we felt that it was a much more powerful idea than the others that we'd been studying. You know, in 1978, the World Health Organization came out with this notion of health for all by the year 2000. But it, it was a great slogan they did lots of things to sort of uh, get the idea out, but there wasn't a plan associated with it. So what we said was, we're going to take seriously this idea that came uh, from uh, mostly uh, Catholic priests in, uh, in, in, uh, in Latin America. And the idea was that you'd live and work with the poorest of the poor and then learn from them what they need. Learn from them what their aspirations are and then do everything you, can, you could to help them meet their aspirations. So we started in Haiti, and we asked ourselves, so if you're going to make a preferential option for the poor in a place like Haiti, uh, what, what, you know, what, what would we do? And uh, when we asked them, uh, if, you were to, if you were to talk to people who were in the field, it wasn't global health back then, it was international health. If you were to ask them what, they would, what, they should, what we should do, they would say, oh, God, Haiti's so poor, you should only do the very minimum, the basics. You, you should only do the things that are cost effective. You should only do vaccinations and, gee, you know, other things just aren't possible. But when we asked the Haitians what they want, they wanted every child to be in school, they wanted to be able to produce their own food, and they wanted a hospital. So that's what we did. We, uh, we built a bakery, we, uh, uh, we built a hospital, we built schools, and we began uh, the process of, of uh, making ourselves humble in front of the aspirations of the poorest people. Now, the second place that we worked on a large scale was Peru, and this is the part of the project that I took most responsibility for. And, and we were going to do the same thing. It's, a, it's an urban squatter settlement. It's, it, on the one hand, it's, it looks very poor because it's a squatter settlement, but if you can see, there are electric poles. So the, the level of poverty was nowhere near the level of poverty in rural Haiti. There, were, there was no electricity at that time in rural Haiti. But then something happened that really challenged us fundamentally. We saw patients like this. This is Melchiades, uh, actually now one of the stars of the, of the movie uh, that was made about Partners in Health. Melchiades was suffering from uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. This is a form of tuberculosis that's resistant uh, to the two most powerful drugs. And so the official position at the time of the World Health Organization, of the Pan American Health Organization, of just about every public health leader was that you do not treat multidrug resistant tuberculosis in poor countries. It's, they said it was too expensive. It distracted attention from treating regular tuberculosis. The, uh, the, uh, the drug regimens were too complicated, and, it, and they were. We're talking about a minimum of 18 months of treatment, and during that 18 months of treatment, at least 12 months, where these patients get an injectable, an intramuscular injection, six days a week for about 12 months. So incredibly complicated. Uh, when these cases come in to uh, the, the, the hospital here, and my, my old teacher Lee Goldman is here, you know, the place, place goes crazy because you have to put them in a negative airflow room to prevent them from infecting anyone else. Really hard to treat. The side effects of the medicines are, are severe. And so this was a fundamental challenge for us. How serious were we? Oh yeah, preferential option for the poor? What about those patients? Are you going to treat those patients? 
we felt we had no choice, and so we began. And what we found was that by using community health workers and visiting patients every day, we got higher cure rates than any hospital in the United States. And it turned out that what was the most important element was seeing these patients every day, providing uh, uh, the, a level of tender loving care by nurses, by community health workers, that got them through this difficult treatment. This is Melchiatis a couple of years ago. I met Melchiatis in Lima uh, when we had our annual meetings down there, and I just couldn't believe it. I mean, this guy looked like he was uh, almost dead, very close to dying. And he's now a confident young man uh, and, and actually uh, a bit of a movie star in Peru because he's in, he's in this film. Then AIDS. So I remember 1982 when I started medical school that we were just beginning to learn about HIV and it was so frightening. And from 1981, when it was first described until 1996, it was hopeless, everyone was dying from it. But in 1996, uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy uh, really completely transformed the disease, except for poor people. And so as we saw the discussion around HIV treatment in poor countries, it was just this intense sense of deja vu. Oh my God, they're doing it again. It's exactly the same thing all over again. They're saying it's just not possible, it's too expensive, it's not cost effective, you shouldn't do it. And in fact, when the administrator of the US Agency for International Development in the early 2000s uh, testified before Congress, here's what he said. If you've traveled to rural Africa, you know this. People do not know what watches and clocks are. They do not use Western means for telling the time. They use the sun. These drugs have to be administered during a certain sequence of time during the day. And when you say, take it at 10 o'clock, people will say, what do you mean by 10 o'clock? So that gentleman had visited Africa sometime before that. And the African colleagues that we knew said, you know, the only one who was late to every meeting was this guy, right? Now, but let me, this is Andrew Natsios. Andrew Natsios is a very good man, right? I don't mean to make fun of him. This is, he's a very good man. And he was only saying what just about everyone else in the world was saying. People who are my heroes were saying, you know, HIV treatment in Africa, I think we're really talking about the next generation. My heroes were saying that. And they were of tiny, tiny few, literally a handful of global public health people who at that time were in favor of trying to treat HIV in Africa. But in Haiti, we were seeing patients like this. This is Joseph June, unfortunately passed away some time ago, but we were seeing patients like this. And at this time, famously, the World Bank's position was that antiretroviral treatment should not be offered. And, and, they f and, and the World Bank actually forbid countries from using World Bank loans for treating HIV. It was not cost effective, it couldn't be done at scale, it was not sustainable over and over and over again. So think about what everyone was saying. Everyone was saying 25 million people in Africa living with HIV, I'm sorry, they're all dead because it's just inconvenient. It's just too expensive. And we kept saying, a small group of us, especially in Haiti, we kept saying that patients like this can get better. They're not a different form of human being. Uh, these medicines will work with everybody. And we began treating and we began making the argument that if we allow this to happen, if we allow 25 million people to die uh, because of our inability uh, to get around this fact that it's complicated and difficult to treat HIV, we will be guilty of a passive genocide. And we, our generation will always be remembered as the generation that allowed 25 million people to die. So we began treating and results were fantastic. It, you know, we used to call it the Lazarus effect of HIV treatment. Now, I made the point about Mr. Natsios because, again, he's a very good man who cares a lot about development uh, and, and about the poor. But what we've learned is that these things happen because people don't always think, even powerful people, they don't, th they, they don't think and make decisions on the basis of rationality and evidence. I wish they did, but they don't. We actually did a world development report a few years ago, and it, calling it, uh, we called it Mind, Society, and Behavior, and the conclusions were that people think automatically. They tend to fill in missing information and think quickly. Uh, people tend to think socially. They're very much affected by what the people around them think. And they think according to mental models. And so the social thinking 
And the mental model that existed at that time was, it's just impossible. And it was difficult for people to look forward and say, what are future generations going to say about us if we let all 25 million people living with HIV die? They were heroes in this fight. And one of them, the most unexpected hero, was George Bush. And everyone around him, his own head of USAID was saying they can't do this because they, don't, they, don't, they can't tell time. But he vetoed all their decisions and said, we're going to do this, and he launched the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, probably the single intervention that's had the biggest impact on Africa in many, many decades. So uh, he, going against the conventional wisdom, uh, made a big difference. And another one was Jeff, your own Jeff Sachs, one of my heroes. Jeff, Jeff was the only one, the only one among the economists who actually came to Haiti and saw that this was possible, and then fought and fought and fought for more financing, more funding for HIV. He taught us the, one of the most important lessons. He said, you know, you guys got to stop talking about the M word and start talking about the B word. Not millions, but billions of dollars. And for us in global health, who had nothing. We couldn't get our heads around it, but Jeff helped us. And he is still fighting the good fight today, but he was absolutely uh, critical in winning this battle. So now there's a lot more financing. This is how much money, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of exploded now in terms of money for, uh, for, for global health. But the lesson from this graph is that it, it's probably going to tail off for a little while, especially given the nature of the global economy. And it's not nearly enough. It's not nearly enough to meet the aspirations of people today. Now, uh, in the, in the mid-90s, the late 90s, and into the 2000s, at a, at a period when most of the, my time had been spent fighting against uh, the World Bank Group, I got so exasperated that uh, with, uh, uh, with colleagues, we uh, wrote this entire book critiquing the World Bank Group. It was called Dying for Growth, uh, Global Inequality and the Health of the Poor. And it was essentially a 500-page, extremely well-researched critique of the World Bank Group. And I was part of a movement at that time called 50 Years is Enough, in which we tried to close the bank and the IMF on its 50th an anniversary. This is 1994. So we lost that battle, which, was, which is good. And we lost that battle. And what happened at around 1995 was that the World Bank began to change very quickly based on evidence. And I have to tell you, this is the thing I'm most proud of, being president of the World Bank Group, is that this is an organization that will respond to evidence, that will change as it needs to. And now I have the great privilege of being president. But let me tell you how that happened. So I was president of Dartmouth, minding my own business, when I get a call from Timothy Geithner. And Timothy Geithner was Secretary of the Treasury. He was also Dartmouth class of 83. And when Tim called me, and Lee knows this story well, it's usually because he has a friend with a kid who wants to get into Dartmouth. I had my piece of paper. I was ready to write down the name of the, the person that Tim was recommending. But he called me and he said instead, hey, how would you like to be president of the World Bank? And I said, you mean the World Bank? He said, what do I need to do? He said, well, come down and talk to President Obama. I said, when? He said, how about tomorrow? Right? So literally the next day, I fly down to talk to President Obama, walk in the office, and um, it's quite an experience walking into the Oval Office, especially with President Obama and that voice of his. And he said to me, he said, so Jim, why should I nominate you to be president of the World Bank? I mean, what am I going to tell people? And this is exactly what he said. What am I going to tell people like Ernesto Zedillo? Uh, Ernesto's a wonderful man, former president of uh, Mexico, uh, uh, a, uh, a great development economist. He said, what am I going to tell people like Ernesto Zedillo, that I chose a physician and an anthropologist and not a macroeconomist to be president of the World Bank? And um, I said to him, I said, well, President Obama, have you, have, you, have you ever read your mother's PhD dissertation? He looked and he said, uh, well, yes, I have. So I, after seeing him speak in 2004, I researched him and I found out that his mother had done a PhD in anthropology at uh, uh, University of Hawaii. So I actually ordered her uh, dissertation from the University of Michigan archives. That's probably like one of five people who'd ever ordered her dissertation. And I read the whole thing. And I said, well, President Obama, you'll remember that, that when your mother went to Indonesia, she studied the artisanal industry. And it was specifically uh, artists who worked in metal, the metal-focused things. I don't know if you've seen these beautiful Indonesian uh, works of art made out of uh, scrap metal. And she showed that while every 
economist uh, suggested that these artisanal industries would be wiped out because of globalization, she showed that in fact they thrived, that globalization was great. And I said, you know, that's, that's what you'll get from me. I'm not going to be able to give you the view of the world from 30,000 feet like macroeconomists do, but I've been on the ground for 25 years, and I'll tell you how our programs are working there. And he, he looked at me and he said, you know, I get that. Now later, uh, uh, at, a, at a more social event, around with other people sitting around a table, he said, you know, Jim, that was one of the best ploys to get a job I've ever seen. <laughs> read, read the president's mother's thesis. So, so you may be thinking you're reading arcane pieces of work, but you never know uh, it, how it might come in handy. Now, at the World Bank Group, two goals, end poverty, boost shared prosperity. And we get to those two goals in three different ways. The first is by boosting economic growth. I'll tell you, uh, I'll, I'll tell you how we're trying to do that. Inclusive, sustainable, meaning, meaning environmentally sustainable economic growth. The two is investing in human beings. And I love that SIPA's hashtag is hashtag invest in people. I think, I saw that on the, on the uh, chart. Invest in people. And the third is to create resilience to the, to the major crises of the time, uh, uh, climate change, refugees, uh, pandemics. Now, this is a difficult part of, uh, of, of the lecture uh, because it, it, it's, it's uh, a conversation with many of you who may have uh, participated in the Occupy movement. How many participated in the Occupy movement? So many of my friends, and certainly my friends' children, participated in the Occupy movement. But since the days when we were studying Marx and Engels and looking at these two ways of, uh, of organizing the world, planned economies versus market economies, this is what happened. President Xi Jinping at Davos uh, uh, just this year, in January, said this. Whether you like it or not, the global economy is the big ocean you cannot escape from. Any attempt to cut off the flow of capital, technologies, products, industries, and people between economies and channel the waters in the ocean back into isolated lakes and creeks is simply not possible. So the head of the largest communist party in the world is telling us that the global market system is the thing we cannot avoid, and so the task is to figure out how we can make the system work for everybody if it is the ocean then we need to equip everyone to be able to swim in it. And that's what they're trying to do, of course, in, uh, in, in, in China. Now, we work very closely with the Chinese government, and I thought, um, I thought that this was uh, such an important statement. And it really defines what I do now every day. Now, uh, this was Occupy. And, and I, I, I think the, 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 uh, the commitment of the Occupy movement was very compelling. The idea is that we are the 99 percent and the financial system doesn't work for us. But what I have learned, probably the most important thing I've learned in my five years as, uh, as uh, head of the World Bank, is that finance is such a powerful tool. And it is our responsibility to make finance work for everybody. Uh, Professor Bob Schiller, Nobel laureate um, economist from Yale, wrote a book called Finance and the Good Society. And if you haven't read it, I, I recommend it. It didn't sell very well, he told me. Uh, but he really points out, and I quote, finance, despite its flaws and excesses, is a force that can potentially help us create a better, more prosperous, more equitable society. We have the potential to support the greater goals of good societies, prosperous and free societies in the industrialized, as well as the developing world, if we expand, correct, and realign finance. Now, this is a picture of the uh, Ghanaian uh, stock exchange. And I have learned about these financial tools, and it's just incredible how powerful they are. These are the tools that just down the road and Wall Street, just down the road and all the great uh, financial industry that sits right here in New York City, these are the tools that people use every single day to make themselves wealthier. And we're now uh, doing everything we can to use those same tools to support the poor. They're, they're great examples uh, of how to do it. Now, in terms of using the tools of the rich to serve the poor, there are some facts that uh, have created a situation of just enormous opportunity. $78 trillion is the size of the global economy. There's more than $10 trillion sitting in negative interest rate bonds. In other words, you, you give your money to the Japanese central bank, and they don't pay you interest, you pay them to hold your money. $10 trillion, negative interest, so you give them money but you pay them to keep it. Right? Another 24 trillion or so 
in very low yielding government bonds. And again, this is because people are worried. People are scared of the risk they would take in putting their money in anything else. And another $8 trillion sitting in cash. These are usually 1,000-year-old bills just sitting in people's safes. Now, everybody who owns this capital wants to get more out of it. They want, they want a better return. And we think that the opportunities in developing countries to get a better return, if we play our role in de-risking and making these investments possible, are just enormous. Uh, uh, we have a fund called the Global Financing Facility. For every dollar that a donor gives us, we can give the country five, four, five, six dollars of not grant-based money, but money that they can pay over 20 or 30 years at 0% interest. So getting five times the money that you can pay back over 20 years at 0% interest often makes much more sense than getting grants. So leverage, something that rich people do every day, is something that now we're trying to use much more for the sake of the poor. I'll never forget the Ebola outbreak. I mean, uh, I think most non-physicians, especially non-infectious disease physicians, have probably forgotten about it, but I will never forget how terrified we were during Ebola. But what happened was we waited way too long. The epidemic started in December of 2013. Money didn't start flowing until September of 2014, nine months later. And so we decided that we were never going to let that happen again. And what we did was we created something we call the Pandemic Emergency Facility. This is an insurance instrument that will disperse automatically when a problem happens. So this is the, these are the number of cases uh, that happened during the Ebola outbreak. Right? And this is when the, mo the, the money started to flow was about in here. Right? right? The money really didn't flow till out in here. If the pandemic facility had been in place back then, we would have dispersed some cash right here at the beginning and probably snuffed it out. But certainly, the automatic uh, part of the insurance bond instrument would have happened here, and we would have had a much better chance of stopping it. Now, this is a completely new financial instrument. Nobody had thought about insuring the poor against pandemics before. But we did it, and in June, I actually did the bond call. I was on the call talking to the different investors, $450 million. And we paid 8.7% interest. And the 8.7% interest was enough for investors to take the risk. They could lose all their money. They could lose all their money, but it was worth the risk because we paid 8.7%. This is what rich people do every day. They share their own risk with the capital markets. We haven't been doing it enough for the poor. We are talking about a human capital project because we're living in the middle of a human capital crisis. Right? This is uh, a map about childhood stunting. Childhood stunting is one of the things that worries me most in the world. Childhood stunting means that your two standard deviations below height for age uh, 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 in, in, uh, in the first two years, but also all the way through five years. Two standard deviations below height for age. What we found is that these children end up actually having 40% less brain mass the mass of their brains is actually 40% lower. And we've done studies on stunted children. They, they don't learn as well, and they don't earn as well. And so what is the percentage? Well, uh, overall, 155 million children. In Indonesia, 37% of their children are stunted. Pakistan, 45% of their children are stunted. Ethiopia, Democratic Republic of the Congo, 50% of their children are stunted. These, ch these children, when they grow up to be adults, will not be able to compete in the global economy. But it's not just, it's not just childhood stunting. That, that we have to, to, to tackle from the early uh, the, uh, very early in a child's life. There's other things. 250 million children in the world cannot read or write despite some schooling in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Three quarters of third graders, and these are children who've been in school up to third grade, Three quarters of third graders in the Democratic Republic of the Congo cannot read a single word. So not only do we have a problem with stunting, we have a problem with education. What we've learned, it's, it, it may be hard to see, that what you're seeing is the top of the, of the graph is the number of years of schooling. The dark blue is the number of years of learning adjusted years of school. In other words, are they actually getting the learning that they're getting from the number of years they're sitting in those seats? And what you see is huge variability. And you can, there are countries in which they may be in school for 10 years, but it's the equivalent of less than five. Now, 
We have a plan for this. Uh, we, they, we just released a world development report on education. There are very specific things that we want countries to do. Uh, but this is a major crisis. Now, what about technology? This is the, one of the coolest things I've ever seen. I visited Rwanda, and Rwanda is the first country in the world to use drones to deliver life-saving blood. So instead of having to create the supply chain to take blood everywhere it's needed, they use drones. And entirely based on automa uh, artificial intelligence. Fantastic innovation. But we think the actual impact of automation is going to be mostly to get rid of jobs. Jobs are going to be lost. Lots and lots of low-skilled jobs will be lost because tasks are going to be done by machines. We may be able to get ahead of it, but not, if we, not unless we start running really quickly. Our teams now are really looking at human capital differently. And we're going to publish soon a, a, a book uh, or a, a, a document that's called The Changing Wealth of Nations. And here's what we found. So the dark blue is human capital. Uh, the lighter blue is produced capital, meaning uh, you know, factories and things that you build that, can, that, that can, can contribute to productive capacity. And the gray is natural capital, um, the forests, uh, you know, the natural resources, uh, uh, energy resources. And what we found is that human capital is so much more important as part of the overall wealth of nations than we'd ever thought. In but in fact, not until very recently have we included an accounting of human capital. Now, some of you may say, why do you keep saying human capital? They're human beings, man. I there's a reason why I'm using the term human capital, because in order to make a change, you're going to have to get the real decision makers who are usually the heads of state, but also the ministers of finance, you're going to have to get the ministers of finance especially to think about investing in human beings differently. So uh, 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 human capital is huge. Now, this is, hu this is overall wealth. This is uh, natural, produced, and human capital per capita. So you can see the high-income countries have a huge amount of, uh, of wealth per capita. And, and, and the majority of it is human capital. The middle-income countries have a lot less. Look at the low-income countries. This is how much the low-income countries have to catch up in terms of human capital if they want to compete in the digital economy. Now, uh, the question then is how do we change the environment so that heads of state and ministers of finance uh, are, uh, cannot but help to invest more in human beings? What do we need to do? Well, one of the things we need to do is to convince them that investing in human beings is directly connected to economic growth. And so we've begun uh, work with the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle uh, with uh, Chris Murray, who's, a, who's a, uh, a, a very good friend of mine. We did internship and residency together. And Chris started looking, using very sophisticated data and analytic tools. If you take the average years of completed school, schooling, if you take the average standardized test scores for math, reading, and science, and then you take physical and mental health in the working age population, if you take those three things, and ask a, a pretty straightforward question. Uh, if, you divided up the, if you divided up countries into quartiles, into four segments, and you looked at the group that improved their human capital the most over the last 25 years, and you compare it to the group who improved their human capital the least over the last 25 years, the difference in economic growth between the highest improvers and lowest improvers is 1.25% of GDP per year. So you take that and multiply that over 25 years, this is extraordinary. And th this is among the highest uh, correlations. I and mean, it's not causation. It's right now we're just we're, we're, we're running regressions and looking at the correlation. But this is among the highest correlations to economic growth that we've ever seen. So we have no choice now but to do this calculation, put rankings together, and reveal to countries how important it is for them to uh, invest in people. Now, how do you do that? How do you actually make things happen? Well, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is famous for having said to uh, labor leaders, I hear you, I like your ideas, now go out there and make me do it. In other words, create an environment where I have no choice but to do what you want me to do. Uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, 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 this is the president of the, uh, of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. Jean-Claude Juncker, in 2007, uh, during, the, um, uh, during the, uh, uh, the, the, the financial crisis, he was prime minister of Luxembourg at that time. He's a very funny man. He said, hey, we all know what to do, 
but we don't know how to get reelected after we do it. So how do we create a situation where we force them to do the right thing, but then also maybe even help them to get reelected? What, what is the process of doing it? Well, one of my, one of my great mentors, and Lee, Lee Goldman uh, knows him, Julie Richmond, he was, uh, he was the uh, Surgeon General of the United States. He, put, he was the, um, the, the creator of, I think, one of the great programs of all time, which was Head Start. And the way he did Head Start was he had a knowledge base that said do it, he had a social strategy, and he had political will. Well, we need now to think about what it would take to create equality of opportunity. We have to base this in a foundation of human solidarity. We have to have the knowledge base, and I showed you the beginning pieces of it, how important human capital investments are. We have to have a social strategy. How do we make it so that the real decision makers will make the right decision? We have to generate through that political will, and then we have to use financing strategies as well. Can we create insurance instruments that will, will, that will happen automatically? Can we uh, use concessional finance, low interest rate finance, to compel people to do the right thing? This is urgent. Aspirations on the rise everywhere. Jobs being eliminated at, at huge percentage. This is, a, this is just our estimate of how many currently existing jobs will be eliminated by automation in these countries. And I, you know, I, this, this ranking of countries on human capital is going to be incredibly contentious. It's going to be incredibly controversial. But I feel that I have a moral responsibility to reveal this connection and to rank the countries in order to, you know, to, 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 to do the right thing by the 155 million children who are living in poverty. I think another person who studied in this area uh, and, and uh, uh, was one of my heroes had the best way of thinking about urgency around this kind of social action. Martin Luther King, in his book, A Letter from a Birmingham Jail, uh, wrote about letters that he received when he was in jail. And one was from a white moderate who told him, all Christians know that the colored people will receive equal rights eventually, but it is possible that you are in too great a religious hurry. It's taken Christianity almost 2,000 years to accomplish what it has. The teachings of Christ take time to come to earth. Now, I hope you see in this statement the same thing that the people who are against us treating MDR, TB, and HIV were saying. This is not a bad person. This is a person responding to the conventional wisdom of his time. To which Martin Luther King responded, such an attitude stems from a tragic misconception of time and a strangely irrational notion that there's something in the flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. Actually, time itself is neutral. It can be used destructively or constructively. More and more, I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than the people of goodwill. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. We cannot be guilty of being silent about the crisis of human capital investments. But we have to be strategic, and we have to find a way to create a situation where there's no choice but to invest. Right now, the situation in many developing countries is, well, if you give us money, and preferably grant money for health and education, we'll do something. Uh, but if you don't, we won't. The levels of investment are just nowhere near what they should be, and so we've got to create an environment that makes it impossible not to do it. Look, when Martin Luther King talks about repent, repenting, my mother was a theologian. And uh, I think it's okay to repent every once in a while. It's good. It's good practice to repent every once in a while. But better than repenting, and especially I see so many students in the room, better than repenting is to think, what are the things that we're either doing or not doing today that in 20 years we'll shake our heads and say, can you believe that that's what we were thinking? Can you believe that that's what they were saying, the white moderates, the head of USAID? Find out what those things are, take them on, and we have then a chance to create a world in which every child has an opportunity to become whatever they want, just like I did uh, coming here from Korea, and just like I know all of you will as well. Thanks very much.
Now we have about half an hour left, so we're hoping to get as many questions from the audience in as possible. Um, when we do eventually go round, there are going to be microphones. People will hand you a microphone. We'll ask you to introduce yourselves and to say what school you're from. And just to give everyone a, a second or two to sort of think up the questions they might want to ask. Um, Dr. Kim, thank you very much for that thoughtful speech. If I could just pick up on what you said there at the end, the idea of launching this ranking, the importance of, of taking action now. I mean, that sounds like quite a radical idea. Why, why the sort of new thinking now? So uh, I, I mentioned it briefly, but um, it, it, what, what we learned from Chris Murray out in the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation is that, and I don't, I don't even actually know what this is, and I know students here know what it is, but the ability to use Bayesian methods, it's a new kind of, uh, of ability to crunch large numbers much more effectively, have given him so much clearer view of uh, what are the causes of death. It's the Global Burden of Disease Report. And if we apply that to not only health outcomes, but also educational outcomes, we're going to find powerful connections and powerful connections to things like economic growth that we wouldn't have been able to do. So things have changed. We've got a lot more data now on uh, health outcomes and educational outcomes. And what Chris tells me is that, uh, and I, I have to give credit to my predecessor, Bob Zellick. Bob really pushed on uh, data transparency. The amount of transparency in the world uh, is just so much greater than it ever was before. Uh, that countries are sharing their data. And th then the question is, you know, do you have enough data and, and good enough methods so that you can be pretty confident in making this connection between uh, 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 health education and growth? And if you've got enough confidence, are you willing uh, to withstand the clear criticism and ang anger that's going to come from countries that come out lower than where they think they should come out? So it's, it's very predictable. We have a measure called uh, uh, um, doing business. And uh, it's, not, it's not a perfect measure by any stretch, but it's the only thing where we look at the ease of doing business in different developing countries. And, and the reaction is usually pretty predictable. Those who come out high, they like it, and they use it. Those who come out low critique our methodology. So uh, we ha we're working so that the methodology is so robust that we'll be able to defend it and keep going. And the other thing we're going to do is we're not just going to say, oh, you guys are in bad shape. For every single country, we're going to work very hard to give them a plan for how they can much more effectively and quickly improve their stock of human capital. So draw attention to the issue and, and sort of use public pressure to try and divert funds. Well, there'll be public pressure, uh, and I'm sure uh, that opposition parties will use this uh, you know, uh, in their own political interest. But what that will do is, for the first time, create a political cost to not investing in health and education, and often that doesn't exist. Uh, the other thing is, I think investors are going to look hard at, um, uh, at, at these rankings and make decisions on where they invest their dollars based on it. And so in a country, if foreign direct investment goes down, what happens often is that your borrowing costs go up, and that gets everybody's attention, right? And so that's not what we're, we're not trying to hurt countries. We're trying to reveal to them uh, the reality of their situation and, and, and the urgency of the task of investing in people. You know, I've been doing this work on global health for 30 years. And I've spent 30 years begging for more financing. Right? And uh, I, I, it, the notion that we could take it from a purely supply-driven, where it's just all about the generosity of donors, to one in which we have more generous donors, because they know how important it is. I mean, we need to keep pushing donors to provide more financing. But link that to demand, where leaders are saying, oh my god, we've got we to we gotta go up these ranks. It's having a real impact on our political fortunes, on our economic fortunes. If we can create a situation like that, then I think we have a much better chance of reaching this situation where, where everyone has, equal, uh, has an opportunity. Now, for those who are watching online or in the room here, please feel free to use the hashtag invest in people to, to sort of comment and share your thoughts. And if we could start taking questions from the floor, I see uh, the lady there in the third row in the blue shirt. Uh, hello, my name is Amna Bhutta. I'm uh, a Fulbright scholar from Pakistan, as an aspiring policymaker for Pakistan, uh, pertinent to fourth industrial revolution. <coughs> Uh, my question is that uh, uh, currently uh, with the recent uh, 
creation of Asian Development Bank, uh, how the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank sort of separate away from the competitive environment that they were uh, operating in initially, <clears throat> and how they can sort of uh, connect together to learn from the World Bank's experience and uh, sort of meet their collective objective of development in the world. Thank you. Th thanks for your question. I, th I think you mean the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Asian Development Bank's been around for a while, and the new player uh, is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Well, we, we work very closely with them, and I, you know, the one, the one thing we have to remember is that there's nowhere near enough resources for infrastructure in developing countries. So we've welcomed them from the very beginning. In fact, there are HR systems, there are financing systems. It, we, we, we provided them with all of that. And right now, at a time when they have very few employees, what they're mostly doing is co-investing with us. And so we'll prepare a project, we'll put all the pieces together, and uh, they just put their money on the table. Now, they're quickly getting capacity and they'll be making their own loans. But you know what, what we've realized, and, and over the past five years, what I've really worked hard on is bringing, bringing all the multilateral development banks together because we have to work together. We have to work together as a single system, and we're closer to that, I think, now than we've ever been. Um, you know, uh, we're talking the, the sustainable development goals are gonna cost, if we're gonna get to the goals by 2030, $4 trillion a year. So you put all the multilateral development banks together, we don't touch that, we're not even close. So we have to work together not only uh, uh, to, to make our own dollars go as far as possible, but we need to use our dollars to bring in all that cash I told you about that's sitting in these negative interest rate accounts. We've got to bring that off the sideline and put it to work for the poor. The gentleman there. Hi, Dr. Kim. My name is Benjamin Wen. I'm from uh, United Nations Development Program. Uh, recently, Professor Scott Rosell argued that 63% of Chinese rural children have not seen one day of high school education. And this conclusion actually stirred much debate on the internet community in China. So many people think we should focus more, more on the software construction, for example, education, rather than the hardware, for, for example, infrastructure. So how do you envision the bank enhancing its cooperation with developing countries, you know, for example, China and other p countries in, China, uh, in Asia? And will there be opportunities to establish relevant initiatives with, for example, the EIIB or other authorities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin, thank you for the question. So uh, what we're trying very hard to do is not go in a direction of either or, right? Either you invest in people or you invest in the drivers of economic growth like energy and transport, things like that. China's actually done quite well in terms of its um, uh, uh, human capital investments. They're, the childhood stunting rates are around eight or nine percent. So you just compare that to some of the other countries, you know, Indonesia 37, Pakistan 45, India 38, China's around eight percent. Now, the, 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 the out, educational outcomes are mixed. I mean, in Shanghai, they're among the highest in the world. Uh, but in the rural areas, they're not, they're not as good. And so um, uh, I think for every country, they're gonna have to step back and say, okay, in addition, to investing in infrastructure, in addition to investing in all these other important parts of, uh, of economic development, we now also know that human capital is far more important as a driver of economic growth than we ever thought. And with every passing year, as automation becomes more sophisticated, more jobs are lost, every passing year is gonna make human capital more important. Right? So in that context, I think we have to think differently. I think the notion that we bring in private sector financing for more infrastructure, will free up money in government budgets to invest in health and education. That's where we think we're gonna be going with many, many countries. But the point is, every single country has to have its own plan. And there's, no, there's not gonna be a one-size-fits-all solution for everybody. And do you see bringing in the private sector as part of the human capital project? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, um, we're now working on, on um, principles for private sector involved in health and education. Because it, it's not straightforward. It's not building more hospitals. Uh, but what we found is that in countries like India, more than half of all health services in India are provided by private practitioners. So if you want to improve the healthcare system in India, you cannot ignore the private sector. You have to figure out how to, to make it work. 
We think that um, uh, as, as jobs in light manufacturing, in agriculture, as they get eliminated, probably the biggest growth is going to be in empathy workers, uh, you know, the uh, community health workers, community social workers, community education workers. And I think that the movement is going to be more in creating uh, uh, cadres of individuals who can provide those services. And I think it's perfectly uh, reasonable to think that, that small and medium enterprises run by women, for example, uh, could be one of the ways of, uh, of bringing those uh, workers uh, online. I know you've been eager to, to get a question in, gentlemen there. Um, thank you for your lecture, President Kim. My name is Mario Saraiva. I'm from SIPA. I'm part of the uh, Masters in Development Practice. And I have a, it's been a, a question I've been pondering throughout my year at SIPA. First is, what does investing in human capital looks like? If you could uh, please expand on that. And then, should we make it profitable to invest in human capital? Or in other words, should it create an environment, as you mentioned, that forces us or forces policymakers to invest in human capital. But then if we do so, can the world really change if we're still acting because of financial returns? Well, uh, <clears throat> the, the, first, the, the, the first part of the question, what does it look like? Right? So let me, just, let me tell you exactly what it looks like. And we're trying to create an example of just what it might look like, starting with a pregnant woman. Right? And so in Rwanda, uh, President Kagame has said, Th their stunting level is 38%. He wants to bring it to zero in like five years, right? Never been done before, that kind of shift. But you could do it. I mean, based on 30 years of work in developing countries, if you had community health workers out everywhere, identifying all pregnant women, making sure they have outstanding prenatal care, and it, this is not rocket science, it's very straightforward, make sure that they have attended births, make sure that children are given appropriate uh, uh, nutrition, and stimulation, early childhood development, from the very beginning, improve the quality of the primary school so that they get preschool, and they start in preschool, and then they go all the way, and every step of the way, you're improving the quality of, uh, of the educational system so that their learning outcomes are getting better, then when they get to be 18 or 21 or whatever and going through college, then I think you've done everything you can to give that, uh, the pregnant woman and her child, uh, every that the, 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 you know, as, 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 as good an opportunity as you can possibly imagine for that particular situation. Now, uh, on the profit motive, um, you know, I, I just refer you back to the quote of President Xi Jinping, right? So, um, uh, China, when it shifted from just simply dictating equality of outcome to letting market forces um, uh, uh, work, uh, you know, it used to be that when I, in the 1980s, Chinese young people could quote from the Little Red Book, from Mao. And now, most people quote Xi, uh, Deng Xiaoping, who said, uh, to get rich is glorious, who said things like, some of us will get rich first. And in comparing planned economies versus market systems, said, I don't care if the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. Right? And so, it, it, I, I don't, for me, it's not an ideological issue and you presented it as, you know, how can this happen if the ideology of profit... I, I, you know, I was trained by Lee Goldman, right? So if you guys don't know how, what, a, what kind of figure Lee is, there's something called the Goldman criteria that we all know. I was trained by Lee Goldman, and what Lee Goldman taught me was, you got to go with the evidence. What does the evidence suggest, right? The evidence suggests that if you want to end extreme poverty, you need more economic growth. Uh, evidence suggests that if you want to end extreme poverty, you have to figure out how countries can insert themselves in, uh, in the global market system. You know, I, I met with the head of the Vietnamese Communist Party, right? And uh, he was a highly respected man uh, who has a PhD in the social sciences. And his PhD was from the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic School of Social Sciences. And his PhD was in that well-known field of party building, party building, right? And I asked him, I said, you know, Your Excellency, how do you reconcile Vietnamese socialism with your embrace of the market system? Because all you guys talk to me about is how you can, you can, you can, in, you can um, intercalate with the market system more effectively. He said, oh, it's very simple. He said, you know, we've read our Marx too. And every perfect socialist system requires a stage of capitalism, right? But he said something else that was even more profound. He said, 
But we realized that to perfect Vietnamese socialism, you needed faster economic growth and more robust job creation. So that's why we do what we do. And so here was a person trained in the USSR in party building, the leader of the, the keeper of the faith of the Vietnamese Socialist Party, who was telling me, hey, buddy, have you seen the evidence? The evidence suggests that whether we like it or not, we have to find a way to insert ourselves effectively. Because if we don't, it will be more poverty, less job creation, less economic growth. If we could go to the back there, the gentleman. <clears throat> Um, hi, uh, Dr. Kim. My name is Gabriel Barrientos. I am uh, a second year student at SIPA, uh, concentrated in development practice. Um, my question is in regards to the investments in education. Uh, particularly, we see that a lot of developing countries focus their investments on more quantifiable things like infrastructure, building more schools, or just uh, getting students into schools, much like Bolsa Familia in Brazil. You just uh, pointed out that schooling does not equate to learning. Right. Um, how can in investment models in education shift into learning rather than just schooling? Yeah. So uh, I strongly suggest you uh, take a look at our World Development Report that came out just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, some, of the, some of the lessons from there are that, you, you, first of all, you've got to be focused on learning and you've got to be evidence-based. And most school systems are not like that. The, the, the great movements uh, uh, around education have been building schools and getting children to sit in seats, in get, you know, getting their butts in seats, as we say. And uh, uh, we, we have a program at the bank called uh, SABER, and I don't remember what SABER stands for, but as in, you know, the Spanish word for no, uh, very much focused on, on going from the quantity of classrooms and the number of seats available to, to actual learning. So one, you gotta focus on the evidence. Two, it's gotta be a whole of government effort. This is not, this cannot just be the, the education ministry. Frankly, education ministries are often the weakest ministries in developing countries. And so what we're trying to do with this human capital index is to force countries, not force, we, we never force countries to do anything, but to make it possible for countries to work with the Minister of Finance, you know, worried about his bond spreads and worried about reducing FDI and have them work directly with ministers of education and ministers of health. There are many, many countries who are investing money in health and education and getting nothing out of it. Right? So our, our laser focus over the next few years is going to be to improve the quality of those investments. But in the World Development Report, we have a whole program of how you can move more toward learning and away from just, the, you know, building classrooms. Right? Dr. Kim, I'm guessing pretty much Everybody in this room has a smartphone. Uh, we're all used to access to the internet. I mean, how has technology, well, has it made life harder or easier for you to fulfill your mission? Well, so the, the, um, uh, the head of our education practice now, one of our most brilliant economists, worked for the World Bank for many years, and he was asked to come back to Peru, his home country, and take over the Ministry of Finance. But what he said to the president was, mm, now, I want to be Minister of Education, because he knew that, he already knew then that better educational outcomes were going to be the most important drivers of, of growth for, for Peru. What he tells me is, yes, technology can be very important, but the biggest problem for him was the ability of principals to manage their institutions and improve the quality of teaching over time. So he, he began focusing on literally management skills of principals. Jack Ma, uh, the, the founder, the brilliant founder of Alibaba in China, is creating an institute just to teach management skills to principals. So it's, um, it, it's potentially great. I mean, I think what Saul Khan has done uh, in, in the Khan Academy, the, the learning modules are fantastic. You know, and um, uh, the Carnegie Mellon teaching modules for chemistry, uh, math, and uh, 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 physics are just incredible, right? So I think there's a lot of great stuff online. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to be a person-intensive uh, process. I, you know, improving the quality of teachers and the managers of teachers has to go side by side with bringing technology into the, into the classroom. And it's also actually not hardware, it's the software that goes on, on, onto the machines that's going to make the biggest difference. We've actually translated Khan Academy stuff into both Arabic and Spanish to see if, uh, if the, the impact that it's had in the United States can be reproduced elsewhere. A couple more questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kim. I'm uh, Juan from SIPA. I'm uh, from South Korea. And I have a question to ask you about 
the Women's Finance uh, Initiative, I mean the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative that was ambitiously launched by the World Bank in July. Uh, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand about how the initiative will work is the one billion financing that the World Bank has will go down to multilateral banks, which will go down to financial institutions, which will eventually go down to women entrepreneurs. But uh, some of the criticism has been about how uh, multilateral banks will be able to arbitrarily define women-owned banks, I mean women-owned businesses, and be able to target the uh, women entrepreneurs that they want. And uh, how does the World Bank intend to target uh, what you aptly call the poorest of the poor? And especially considering the fact that a lot of women entrepreneurs in developing countries are engaging in informal networks and informal markets where uh, they're not captured by the state governments or formal institutions. And also, uh, if you don't mind, could you give us an update on the financing? Because I'm, from what I understand, uh, 325 million was funded in August, uh, and I haven't seen an update since then, so. That's a wondering. lot of questions, <laughs> a lot of questions. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, but. I know, so let me just, so we started something uh, uh, strongly supported by the Trump administration, but also any Ivanka Trump specifically, uh, and it's actually built on our previous experience. We had something, we did a program called 10,000 Women that we did with Goldman Sachs, where uh, we, so, the, the great thing about the World Bank Group is that we have been in these developing countries, in the case of IFC, the private sector group, for 60 years, in the case of the World Bank for more than 70 years. So we have incredible networks in, in all of these different areas. And uh, the, the idea here, and it's just getting started, and the number right now is over 350 million, and the 350 million of grant donations will be leveraged with our own financing to, I think, well over a billion. We're not quite sure how far it'll go. But right now, uh, there is a huge gap in financing for women entrepreneurs. Part of it is because they're women, and the, and the, the criteria for getting a loan is often uh, something that, that, that just can't be uh, overcome in many, many developing countries. And so that's why we created women, uh, a, a fund specifically focused on women. We will preferentially try to find women entrepreneurs. Uh, the 10,000 Women Project has been tremendously successful. And because we have these networks, we're able to, to find uh, women entrepreneurs. Now, you're right that in many uh, countries, a lot of the women-owned businesses start out informally. Now, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the microenterprise lending phenomenon has done a lot uh, to support informal uh, women-owned businesses. But one of the problems with microenterprise lending is that it, that very, very few women who started off getting these microloans turned their informal enterprises into formal businesses. That's why we're focusing on entrepreneurship, because we want to identify those uh, women who've done well on an informal level and who are now ready to create formal businesses. Now, it's just one part of what we do. We also have conditional cash transfers that go directly to the poorest women. Uh, but uh, the fact that we were able to raise $350 million from uh, 16 or 17 different countries in four months was, uh, was, was really encouraging. I think we've got time for just one or two more questions, the lady there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Catherine. I'm an international student from Venezuela here at Columbia University. And uh, my question is regarding countries that are facing uh, a lot of political instability. Uh, for example, Venezuela in the last uh, few years has risen, the poverty rate has risen from 40% to over 80%, and the humanitarian crisis is, is really, really precarious. So how do you deal, or what's the base, best way to deal with countries in situations like this where the political instability has caused uh, such extreme rates of poverty? Yeah. So um, we, we're, watch, we, we're, not, we're not working in Venezuela right now. And uh, uh, part of it's because we would only work there if the government asked for our support, and they haven't asked for our support yet. Um, uh, our, unfortunately, fragility, conflict, violence, uh, there are now two billion people living in countries that are in some way affected by fragility, conflict, and violence. So in our Fund for the Poorest Countries, uh, it's called IDA, uh, which is $75 billion over, uh, over three years, we have doubled the, uh, the, 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 the amount of funds that are going to go to fragile and, uh, fragile and conflict-affected countries. Um, 
we've been thinking hard about this, and we, we as a World Bank, we're not very involved in things like refugee problems. But Antonio Guterres, now the Secretary General of the United Nations, when he was the High Commissioner for Refugees, came to me and said, you guys have to get involved in the refugee uh, situation. And I, and I said, why? He says, because some of these situations last for so long that we find ourselves a bunch of lawyers doing development work. So we need to work together. We need to find a way to go upstream and stop these things from happening. So what we're focused on right now is identifying sort of pre-fragile, pre-conflict countries and intervene uh, to see if we can prevent this path down to fragility and conflict. What, one of the things we know, investing in human beings is critically part of it. And one of the things I worry most about is there are so many refugees and so many of those refugee children are not getting any education. So they're, in the time that they're refugees, uh, we're investing essentially nothing in, uh, in, in their education. So um, uh, the reason this is so urgent and it's something that the, that the Germans understand very well. I mean, you know, during the German G20, which is just, you know, it's still going on, but the, the summit was in Hamburg uh, in July. Uh, Chancellor Merkel, at that time, it was the uh, 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 Minister of Finance, Wolfgang Schäuble, kept saying, okay, we, we absorbed one million refugees from the Middle East and North Africa, but if we don't invest more in, in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, what we saw over the last few years is nothing compared to what will happen if, uh, if people from Nigeria and Kenya start getting on boats, if Ethiopia falls apart. So the German leadership of the G20 understood very carefully, I mean, understood very well how important prevention was, right? And so this is part of that effort, right? Uh, we're, we, we, the, the prevention piece of it is investing in human beings so that instead of being frustrated uh, by the lack of opportunity, uh, that they're creating businesses, that they're, you know, um, becoming doctors and lawyers and other kinds of things that um, uh, will, it will improve the prospects for everyone. So, not working in Venezuela, there's other countries, we're not working in Cuba, not working in North Korea, a number of countries we're not, where we're not working yet. But uh, when Myanmar opened up, when Burma opened up, and there are, there are lots of issues there now, we were one of the first, first organizations to go in, and that's my, my, my hope, is that once a very conflict-affected, fragile country opens up, we can move in quickly. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. We are out of time, but thank you very much for all of your questions. Of course, you can keep it. Once again, thank you. Thank you. And of course, you can keep the conversation going online. The hashtag is invest in people. Um, and with that, that brings to an end the 2017 Gabriel Silver Memorial Lecture. Dr. Thank Kim, you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle.